Welcome back once again to season four of the podcast. I'm your host, Amanda Blackwood. As many of you know, I wrote my autobiography as a survivor of human trafficking. It's called Custom Justice. But if you didn't know, you do now. Keeping in line with that, this entire season and last season has been focused on interviewing people who did or plan to write about their own experiences as trauma survivors and how they overcame the past. And as much as we all hate commercials, they are a necessary evil these days. This is what keeps the show on the air. You can also show your support by purchasing one of my many books or donating through PayPal or leaving a review on whatever platform you listen to this podcast on. You can find the links for the books or donation options in the podcast description. As always, a portion of the proceeds go to local organizations that help fight human trafficking. Hey folks, welcome back to the podcast. As always, I'm your host, Amanda Blackwood, and I have such an incredible story for you guys today. Holy cow, what he hasn't been through. Um, His name is Adam Lucero, and I'm going to let him tell the story better than I ever could. But man, what a story. Welcome to the show, Adam. Hey, it's nice to be here. And yeah, the story is a little bit wild here. Just the classic tale of going to the movie theater and getting stabbed in the throat, arm, and chest with a chef knife. You know, it just happens every Wednesday. Oh but, my uh, gosh. Yeah, with that being said, I won't leave you guys on that kind of cliffhanger. We'll get right into it. So literally, just imagine that you're sitting in a movie theater. The lights dim, the movie starts, and your eyes are just glued to the screen. 10 minutes passes in, you're more sucked in, and then all of a sudden, you feel a hard hit to your throat. Well, because that's exactly what happened to me. And so when I stood up, like my initial reaction was like, this guy hit me hard. So I stood up and I was like, dude, what the hell? And then I felt another punch to my arm and chest. And then I turn around and push this guy. And as I push him, I feel a cut on my wrist and ear. And instantly, I knew this guy didn't punch me, he stabbed me. And so I started yelling, I've been stabbed, I've been stabbed. The lights turned on and I see him start running away, run down the stairs. And I take off my shirt and wrap it around my neck because like I'm literally bleeding out. So as I mentioned earlier, like this guy had a chef knife. The ones get bigger, closer to the handle. The blade gets bigger. And that one went halfway through my throat. It punctured my lung and went extremely deep through my arm, almost out the other side. So I'm sitting there bleeding out, take off my shirt, wrap it around my neck. And about like a minute passes and these two older women come running up. They're like, what should we do? And I tell them, just put pressure on my neck, like hold the blood in. So they're doing that. Then I hear someone say, should we call 911? And I <laughs> lose it. I kid you not. Like as I'm bleeding out on the floor, I yell back to him. Yeah, you should call 911. If you don't call them in this situation, when would you? Like that is what 911 <laughs> is designed for. And then so my just my perception of time's a little disordered but i'd say about like five to ten minutes passes before the paramedics come and they start asking me all these questions what year is it what's your name who's present and i get it they're making sure i'm conscious staying with them whatever it is but i'm just like can you guys just stop asking me these questions and save my life you know like i think we have a little bit more urgent matters here and then um they say like all right let's get them up on the stretcher so they toss me up on the stretcher and I feel all my wounds worse than the, than the initial stabbing because I don't have the adrenaline in me anymore. And so they start taking me down the stairs and for every stair that there was, which I was at the top row practically for every stair there was or step there was, I felt like I got stabbed in all those places all over again. And I kid you not, it was the most excruciating pain of my entire life was just going down those stairs I still remember like holding on to myself and trying not to scream my guts out. It was just so painful. So we get down outside and we get into the ambulance. And I remember thinking, okay, the paramedics caught me. I can start to relax. And then as soon as I get that thought, I feel a cold rush through my entire body. And it dawned on me. I was like, I could die. Like I lost a lot of blood here. And so... I see them come over with the oxygen mask and I remember thinking, don't fall asleep. You're not supposed to fall asleep in this situation. They put the oxygen mask over me and I'm knocked out within like seconds. I wake up seven days later from an induced coma and I'm broken. Like I'm literally living off tubes. You unplugged them. You unplugged my life. Besides that, it was just like 
my muscle decayed from years of weightlifting. So for context, I used to be like 170 pounds, 8% body fat. Now mm. I'm 130 pounds and no, like just dick and bone. Right. But the worst part wasn't that what happened to my physique. It was what happened to me internally. That meaning like, I kid you not, after I got to a point where I could eat normal food again, I literally would fall asleep at my plate because eating depleted my energy that much. I felt like running a marathon. And then it's just my cognitive function. Just, it felt like my brain wasn't firing on all cylinders, almost like it was comparable to a four-year-old. Like I just couldn't answer questions. I couldn't think clearly. I couldn't even think critically. And the worst part though was what happened to me mentally, my confidence, it just disappeared. Like a quarter in a magic show and I was filled with self-doubt and negative thoughts. Can I still hit all my ambitions in life or is my potential destined to rot away. So when I hit this point, I really only had two options. I could give up, quit on my potential and be a victim. And I have every right to do so. If anyone's going to be a victim, it's a good place to be it right there. Right. <laughs> right. But I didn't want to give up on my life. So I chose the second path and I started learning the secrets of evolution, biology, and psychology that enabled me to build myself up again, how to start feeling more motivated so that I can do the things I needed to do, like my physical therapy, my speech therapy, normal therapy, go to my EMT, I had all these different appointments. And so I, I just had to start getting to this point where I was motivated to do those things. And so once that started happening, just day by day, week by week, I started building myself back to strength, doing workouts that would boost my energy, my mental alertness. And then fast forward about five or six more years, almost seven years at this point. And here I am. I, I run a business helping driven men and entrepreneurs tend to be a pretty big part of it, helping them optimize their performance so that they achieve more and really grow their business. Man. Did they ever figure out who it was that did it or why? Yeah. So the crazy part was the cops were looking for him literally at the time that he attacked me because two days prior, he stabbed another person 50 times, five zero. So there was a homeless man sleeping on the sidewalk. This guy went up to him with the chef knife. Boom. And yeah, so he actually was schizophrenic. And so that's why he did it. And I actually have no hard feelings for him. Because he was in his own world battling his own demons. And the reason why I guess I have that feeling is also because like obviously we had to go to court. But the thing is, we couldn't go to court because he was declared insane, right? But so right. he worked with psychiatrists, psychologists, whoever it is. And after a few years, he regained consciousness. And when he found out what happened, he pled guilty because he felt so bad. So it just goes to show like he was just in a tough place himself. Like he has remorse about what he did. And so I don't think he's like a terrible person. It's like, who's to say if I was, because he was homeless too. So I'm like, who's to say if I was in his circumstances, homeless, had terrible food, terrible water quality. It's like, who knows what kind of mental health I'd be in, you know? So yeah, but in wow. a nutshell, it's because he was schizophrenic. Oh my gosh. That's, just nuts. I, and it's really cool that he was able to wake up enough to have that remorse because a lot of people never really do. Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah. And if you had words for him that you would be able to say, what would you tell him? I would tell him. And it's funny that you asked this question because like, I've literally been debating like if I should go visit him, but at the end of the day, I'm like, it's just not worth my time and energy. Right. But what I've been contemplating or was contemplating was going up there and telling him like, look, man, you stab me all good. Like my life's totally fine now. I'm on a good path. In fact, like this kind of propelled my life in hindsight. And so like, don't worry about me. So if you have any guilt with that, don't worry about that. But the other thing is like, look, you did kill that other person. So, I mean, no matter what, he's probably going to have some remorse, but if I were to talk to him, I would tell him like, look, man, my life's good. So don't have stress about me or anything like that. That's cool. That forgiveness is not an easy thing to find sometime. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. But it's really powerful because it's like, and holding on to that anger and that resentment, it does no good to you. It serves no benefit to you. And so, right. yeah, like you said, it's easier said than done, but that's a place that everyone should try and get to. The, the less anger you can have in your body and system, the, the better your mental health is going to be. Absolutely. It holds you back from so many different things. I mean, if you still held on to that anger, do you think you would be uh, an entrepreneur now or empowering other people to do the same things? Yeah, but not at the same scale, probably. <laughs> yeah, yeah. you sound like a real go-getter. Have you always been like this? Yeah, so I mean, like growing up, it was 
I was in middle school. I'd go to the 99 cent store, buy candy, then sell it for like three X profit, essentially at school. <laughs> and in high school, I'd every summer I'd just buy and sell electronics off Craigslist and make like 5k in the summer or 6k, which high school is decent, you know? And then in college, I started a moving business. I knew nothing about like the moving industry, but I just saw someone that was, had a business in there and they were terrible business people. So I was like, if this person can be successful here, like I could probably crush him. And then I did. And so I started a business there. So I've always had more of this entrepreneur spirit, but the thing was I actually accepted a sales job after I graduated college. And that's why I was in Northern California when I got stabbed. Like I was up there looking for housing and just trying to kill time essentially. And so that's why I went to a movie by myself um, but yeah, so I've always known I was going to be like an entrepreneur. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. And mm -hmm. just learning about your story. I just, I just find you fascinating. How do you kill procrastination? Yeah. So ultimately there's a few different ways we could always handle it. And so everyone has their own approach, but really we tackle it from every possible thing. Now the, the where I think that procrastination ultimately stems from is a lack of alignment between your two minds, your subconscious and conscious. So let me explain this in a way that would probably resonate with your audience a little bit more here. So we all know that every New Year's resolutions, they fail, right? 95% of them fail to maintain it within three weeks. And that's because what's happening is they're using their conscious mind to try and change their actions, their behaviors, and their life. You know, I'm going to work out, eat healthy, be more productive in my business, whatever it is. It goes great for a few days. You're feeling fantastic about yourself, but then one day you feel tired, lazy, or unmotivated. So you tell yourself, oh, I've been doing a fantastic job. I deserve one day off only to fall back into your old patterns and ruts. We all know this story, right? Again, it's because you're, you're using your conscious mind, but your subconscious mind doesn't want you to change your actions. And it sees every habit as a survival mechanism, which is why it's so hard to break. So basically what happens is you use your conscious mind to try and change your actions. Subconscious mind wants you to stay the same. You get into this brain battle, fall back into your old patterns and ruts within a week usually. And so what you need to do to escape this is link your subconscious to your conscious mind so that when you tell yourself you're going to work out, you actually do it and you feel excited to do it. And so ultimately that's one of the methods that we use. We call it our mind linking method. And yeah, I mean, our, Clients just get crazy results when they harness this power. But the thing is, it's like procrastination can be tackled on so many more levels. Like the other way I like explaining this is like, look, when you wake up, you're tired, you're not thinking clearly, you feel unmotivated, you're more likely to procrastinate and skip on those activities you know you should do versus those days where you're full of energy, you woke up feeling great. And so then we also want to make sure that your health is optimized so that every single day you're feeling good, you're energized, you're in the right mental state for this. And so there's really multiple ways you can tackle procrastination. But ultimately, if there's one thing, it's linking your two minds together. That is really cool. I know with a lot of trauma survivors, which is a lot of the audience, um, a lot of us have this thing where whatever it is that's going on, we have health issues or whatever. Mm -hmm. It can be really difficult for somebody like us to build or gain any energy. How do you help people to have more energy? Yeah. So the way I always explain this is like, look, the number one factor in your energy is going to be your sleep. I say this because you could eat the healthiest. You could cut out all alcohol, cut out all carbs, sugar, whatever you, whatever you define as healthy or whatever. But if you get three hours of sleep, guess what? You're not going to be energized the next day. So we always say is like the most bang for buck is going to be sleep. Now I know there's people listening to this thinking I have insomnia. I can't get good sleep because X, Y, Z, you know, but first of all, let me ask you, even if you have insomnia, how is holding that belief that you have it serving you towards a better life? Is it enabling you to try and get better sleep or is it leaving you in this vicious cycle where you're a victim, you feel powerless and you don't get good sleep. So even if you do have insomnia operating from that mental state or that belief that I have insomnia, it isn't serving you towards a better life. But the second part of that is I'm willing to bet 99% of people on this planet that think they have insomnia do not. It's just poor sleep habits. Now I, I know this for a fact because I've helped literally hundreds of people dial in their sleep. And I always hear the same thing. I have insomnia. And then what happens is we work on their sleep habits, get a nice night routine in, 
start doing the things they need to do to get better sleep. And then they get great sleep within weeks. And so that's why I'm saying this, I'm speaking from experience when I say most people that think they have insomnia don't have it. And again, even if you are one of the few people that actually does, it's like operating from a place where you believe that isn't serving you towards a better life. So you might as well stop operating that way. Right now right. the second part to this is I already know you're going to ask me, Adam, well, okay, how do we get good sleep then? So let's just get into it. So there's a few things you could do. The first thing is there's two main hacks that are going to be very potent. And if you just do these two things consistently, you will get fantastic sleep. First one is go to bed before 10 PM because 10 PM to 2 AM are the golden hours of sleep. So the way I like explaining this is, have you ever gone to bed at one in the morning or two in the morning <laughs> and felt good the next day? It doesn't matter if you get eight or nine hours of sleep. Have you ever felt good? I'm going to guess great. no because, yeah, because <laughs> I never have at least. I've never gone to bed at one and woken up going, oh, I feel good. So the hours you sleep are not created equal. You know, a lot of people think, oh, I got seven or eight hours. Okay, well, first of all, what kind of hours were you sleeping? Was it earlier in the night? And then secondly, you could sleep seven hours or eight hours, but if you wake up in the night, it's going to mess up the quality of sleep. So there's so many different factors there. So simply put, go to bed before 10 p.m. Now, the second thing to that is you want to go to bed within 30 minutes of the same time every single day. It's literally that consistency that's going to dial in what's called your circadian rhythm, which is like one of the biggest factors in your hormone production, which ultimately dictates how you feel. So I also know that people that are hearing this, they'll go, oh, I know hormones are important, but do you really? Do you really know to the actual extent? And so the analogy I'm using is like, look at people who take steroids. They often get roid rage or the smallest thing it ticks them off like a bomb and they're not in control of their emotions because they have a surplus of testosterone. So when you optimize your hormones, you just naturally feel more energized, more grounded, more centered, more like yourself. And so those are ultimately the two hacks that will really help people dial in sleep. Now, the thing is, we, there's much more things we can do to help you get better sleep, but we'd be here for probably another 20 minutes if I were to, to get into it. So <laughs> That's pretty cool. I mean... Um, a lot of people confuse insomnia with having PTSD too. So uh, trauma mm -hmm. survivors can really struggle with this big time. Mm -hmm. And I learned in recent months that turning off the blue screens is mm -hmm. helpful. Sit mm -hmm. back and read a book for a little while. Help your brain to quiet down a little bit. Yeah, two things to that. It's like, yeah, that's the thing. Is like, I always talk to people that think they have insomnia. I'm like, oh, what are you doing for the hour leading up to bed? Oh, I'm watching a movie or a TV. Uh, okay. I think I found one of the big reasons here. All those yeah. colors release chemicals in your brain. Like the blue light, for example, releases dopamine and just makes you hardwired. And then the second thing is instead of your mind starting to be calm and centered and relaxed from the day, it's freaking super active watching a movie, super engaged. So not only do you have these chemicals in your brain, but then also your mind's just super hardwired and not ready for sleep. So again, it's like, just focus on getting better sleep habits. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's such a, a great health advice just across the board, not just for entrepreneurs or tra uh, trauma survivors, but pretty much everybody. Mm -hmm. you, know, you can improve your life in so many ways and talk about the testosterone levels and all that stuff. I have thyroid disease. Mm. It's linked, of course, to past traumas and that kind of stuff. But I have learned so much about how important it is to have these balanced hormone levels mm -hmm. because of all the medical stuff that I've been going through over the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. It's nuts how much your life depends on this stuff. Oh, hundred percent. Like so yeah. many people, like if they just actually had their hormones optimized, they would feel so much better and it just has a snowball effect in their life. Right. Absolutely. And it can be tough to kind of balance that stuff out too, depending on what's going on in your system, but it's worth trying. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. Now, can any entrepreneur be a seven-figure entrepreneur? This is going to be a question that's close to my heart because that's mm -hmm. what I'm aiming for. Mm -hmm. And so the answer is yes, because the thing is, we all have the same potential. Every single human being has the same potential. There's going to be a few exceptions. So I should say 99.99% .99 of people are because we're all born with the same thing. I mean, you aren't the people that are listening to this weren't born to anything that I don't have, except maybe a few people like the 0.01 I'm talking about. So anyone's capable of it. But the mistake or the reason why most entrepreneurs will never reach seven figures is because they're not operating like a seven figure entrepreneur. They don't think like a seven figure entrepreneur. They don't behave like an entrepreneur, seven figure entrepreneur. And thus, they don't have the results that a seven figure entrepreneur has. And so ultimately, 
the examples I like using here is like, if you look at every millionaire, multimillionaire, you're going to notice they have current underlying common ways of being. They operate in the same way. They're being 100% responsible for all the results in their life. I mean, a good example of this is like, look at Elon Musk. He's literally doing things that people thought were impossible. Space travel, doing so many different things. Neuralink, I mean, we could get into it, but the point is this. Do you think he comes across roadblocks? Of course, he comes across them every single day of his life. But do you think he sits there and goes, oh, you know what? Space travel isn't possible because I don't have an answer for this. No, he takes 100% responsibility. He's being 100% responsible. And thus, he finds a solution. Versus most entrepreneurs, they have that victim mindset. They'll find an easy way to make excuses because they're not being responsible. Another way is they're not being committed to their goals. They'll let their emotions dictate their actions throughout their day instead of operating from 100% commitment, doing the things they need to do regardless of how they feel. And so it's simply just different ways of being. And so if you want to become a seven-figure entrepreneur, you first have to operate like one. You need to start thinking like them. You need to start being a seven-figure entrepreneur. Then you'll have the results that they have. And what's the easiest way to build the habits to be able to build yourself up into this? Yeah, so uh, ultimately kind of depends. Um, again, what usually honestly needs to happen is more of a perspective switch. And so, first of all, they need to obviously have the right information to, to form the habits. But then when it comes to just forming habits in general is you want to start with these smaller changes because the thing is lots of entrepreneurs and lots of people in general, you know, they get motivated to change their life. They feel this motivation in the moment. They're like, I'm going to change my life. I'm going to do X, Y, and Z. Then we all know what happens. But again, a few days to make progress, then that motivation fades. And then they skip out on doing those key activities. So what you want to do when you're trying to form habits is start with these smaller changes. So for example, let's say that you tell yourself, you know what, I, I want to start reading more. Don't tell yourself you're going to read for 45 minutes or 30 minutes a day. Do tell yourself that you're going to read for one minute a day. Because even in those times when you're feeling unmotivated, you can still easily go pick up that book and read for a minute. There's less resistance versus that 30 minutes. It seems very gigantic, enormous. And now you're thus more likely to skip on doing that activity. And then the thing is with habits, it's all repetition. So if you pick up the book every single day for a minute, well, after 30 days, 60 days, you're going to effortlessly pick up that book and read. There's going to be no internal battle. Plus, the second side to that is <clears throat> most of the time, it's just like you have to jump through these mental hurdles to pick up the book. But once you start actually doing it, it's not painless. Or it's pretty painless. Like you actually enjoy it. And sometimes we'll start reading for the 30 minutes anyways. And so the way I like to explain that is like, I remember when I was in high school, college, like I would hate doing homework. I would always procrastinate, let it get to the last minute. But then when I'd start doing it, it was never that bad, but it was just like the initial hurdles that you have to jump through to start. Right. And so that's why starting with these smaller changes is really powerful. Very cool. Now, would you consider yourself an introvert or an extrovert? Or have you, uh, and have you always been that way? So I used to think I was an extrovert and I guess it kind of depends on people's definitions. And so I would say that I'm actually more of an introvert. And so I used to think I was an extrovert because like, okay, this might come off cocky, but I feel like I can, I can get along with people and make conversation pretty well. But the reason why I say I'm an introvert is because I realize I like being by myself. I like staying at home rather than going out mm -hmm. and preserving my energy and just chilling a little bit more. So I think I am an introvert, but again, it kind of depends on like your definition, right? <laughs> right. And that's so great. And it can change as we get older and go through different things too. Mm -hmm. Different phases yeah. of your life for sure. Right. How do you celebrate the wins in your life? When something goes your way, do something really well, how do you celebrate? Hmm. So I would say I try not to celebrate the wins. And that's actually pretty interesting. Most people are going to think at least. And the reason why is because, at least in my experience, what I've realized, if I celebrate the wins, then what I also tend to do is ce not celebrate, but beat myself up about the losses. And so I actually try not to even celebrate the wins. Like there's days I close like what, 10K or something like that. I, I try not to feel like excited about it because then that means if I have days where I have zero revenue days, then I'll tend to feel bad about myself. And so I try not to really celebrate them, but instead just 
be a little bit like proud of myself and reflect back and be like, look, think back to five years ago. If I had this day, like I never thought I would have this type of day. And so that's kind of how I do it. If, I don't know if that directly answers your question. Or <laughs> I kind of circled around it, I think, but. No, that works. I like that. It's, it's a little bit different than what most people would expect. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And there's always one last question that I ask people before I let them go. It's my favorite question of the episode always. Let's hear it. What is one thing that you love about yourself that's not related to your physical appearance? Mm. I would say my determination. I think that's what really has enabled me to bounce back from being stabbed. I think that's really what's enabled me to build out the businesses that I have. And so, yeah, I would say it's the determination or the mental state. Like I literally feel like invincible. And I, my clients tell me the same thing it, again, it's from really getting yourself to operate from a more powerful place. But I would say it's that feeling of invincibility I have. And that comes from knowing that you can tackle whatever life throws at you because you are literally that capable or powerful. And so I would say, I guess now that I'm speaking out loud, I would say more about, the personal power that I have. If you've enjoyed tonight's episode, please make sure you check out the episode description. There you'll find links on how you can learn more about this guest, links to connect with them on social media, and how to support the podcast. Remember, I don't get paid to do this. My boss is a bit tight-fisted. I can say that. I work for myself. In short, this show really is all about the guest. If you've enjoyed their interview, please feel free to let them know. You can also tune in to my other podcast, Growth from Darkness, which is co-hosted by a lovely lady from Australia. We talk about what trauma responses are and healthy ways to move beyond the past. For more information, just go to growthfromdarkness.com. You can also follow us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash growthfromdarkness.